Hello. 1986 has been a bumper year for target fiction, to coin a phrase. On the Doctor Who Literature Podcast over the last three months, we have covered some pretty interesting books that were published by Target in paperback in the year 1986. We've talked about The Gunfighters, a story so meaningful to me, that discussion of the story and the novelization took up two weeks of this show, both guests starring Jim Sangster. We talked about The Time Monster, the first of two Terrence Dicks novelizations to come out, featuring Cy Hart. We talked about The Twin Dilemma, the novelization of the controversial Colin Baker debut story. And the novelization is also not without controversy, but for different reasons. Graham Burke from Reality Bomb was my guest. Live at Gallifrey One, I discussed Galaxy 4, William M's only target novelization with Stacey Smith, and Time Lash, Glenn McCoy's only novelization with Simon Gurrier. We talked about the first two Companions of Doctor Who books, both targets but not novelizations. First, Dale Smith joined me to discuss Turlow and the Earthling Dilemma. And then Jim Sangster was back a few weeks later to discuss Harry Sullivan's Roar, complete, with theme song and video. Michael Storm made his first appearance on this show to discuss the first Pip and Jane Baker novelization, Mark of the Ronnie, with a very interesting prose style. Jim Sangster was here to talk about The King's Demons, again with a song and music video. Nathan from Pixel Who was here to discuss The Savages, the first of three Ian Stewart Black novelizations. And then Conrad was here to talk about Fury from the Deep, the bumper volume. Last week, James Goss joined me to discuss The Celestial Toymaker and his own novelization, The Giggle, which is kind of a sequel to Celestial Toymaker, but goes off in so many more interesting directions. We are not done with the 1986 targets either. I do have another guest lined up at some point to discuss the Celestial Toymaker, the TV story, and its very troubled genesis. And then next week, we'll wrap up the 1986 targets with The Seeds of Death, Terrence Dix's second and final novelization of the year. This week, we are talking about a Doctor Who book from 1986, but it is not a novelization, and it is not put out by Target Books. Tony Witt from the Doctor Who Book Club podcast will join me to discuss the Find Your Fate series, and specifically Find Your Fate number four, Mission to Venus, publication date in paperback, October 1986. It is a very fun conversation. We talk about a lot of things related to his podcast and mine, and as is not unexpected for a show like this one, it takes us a few minutes, and by a few minutes I mean the better part of half an hour, to get around to Mission to Venus itself, I want to issue a couple of preemptive corrections. The cover art, the cover painting for Mission to Venus, is by an artist who went by Aromas. At the time of recording, I had not yet tracked down who that was. Romus Kukalis, K-U-K-A-L-I-S, does have a brief Wikipedia page, a Canadian-American painter, who has also done work for Magic the Gathering and for the Animorphs. I am not hugely familiar with him, and that will become apparent over the course of the conversation with Tony, but that is his cover painting. The interior illustrations of the book are done by Gail Bennett, an American Doctor Who fan artist. Tony and I are perhaps not very charitable to Ms. Bennett. I want to apologize for that in advance. I don't like complaining too much on this podcast. We do both take issue with one illustration later in the book, but... Gail Bennett does get copyright credit for all the interior illustrations, and illustrations are a very big part of the DNA of Doctor Who literature, from the earliest Chris Achilleo's target covers to the interior illustrations that graced many of the first dozen or so target books before those were discontinued. It is good to have a Doctor Who book with interior illustrations, even if, as is the case this week, it is not a target. While there were six Find Your Fate books, Mission to Venus is the only one that I currently own, and is the only one that we'll be discussing on Doctor Who literature, but it is part of the legacy of 1986 in Doctor Who fiction. It is important to discuss, and Tony and I will have a blast doing so. We hope you join us for the rest of the episode next week, The Seeds of Death, closing out 1986, then a bonus 
episode featuring all of my other interviews recorded live at Gallifrey One that I have not yet found a place for on the show. And then, after that, 1987, a year that changes everything for Doctor Who novelizations and for me personally. You'll hear all of those stories in the coming weeks, but for now, let's get to it. Direction point! Direction point! A Doctor Who Podcast Network. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Doctor Who Literature. We're a member of the Direction Point Doctor Who Podcast Network. My name is Jason. Ordinarily, this is the podcast taking you through the world of the Doctor Who novelizations put out by Target Books from 1973 onward in publication order. Well, today we are going in publication order, but we are not talking about a Target book. And I am joined by a very special guest. Tony Witt from the Doctor Who Target Book Club podcast. Welcome back to the show. It's been a minute since I had you on. It's been more than a minute. It's been several minutes. Yeah, it's good good to be back. Thank you for having me for this, especially for this book. I had you on as one of my very first guests. So you were on episode seven for Day of the Daleks when my listening audience was a small fraction of what it is now. And of course, since my podcast owes so much to yours... I felt it was important to have you on right away, and obviously I've been remiss in having you back since then, but I'm very say. glad you're joining us. <laughs> yes, I was about to say, it's it's overdue, and thank you for thank you for inviting me back, though, absolutely. We need to have uh, you on ours as well. So I did have three appearances on your show. Uh, I was on for the novelization Doctor Who and the Doomsday Weapon, which is the adaptation of Colony in Space, and then I was on for Horns of Nymon, and then I was on for Black Orchid. So you can see the law of diminishing returns right there. I was there for an all-time banger, one of the first novelizations. I was there for a very good Terence Dix book, which is much shorter than his usual output, because that was the year that he wrote ten novelizations. Mm-hmm. And then I was on for Black Orchid. So yeah. hopefully my next appearance on your show does not <laughs> continue the trend of books that get worse and worse and worse. Well, uh, I can't promise that because we're about to enter the Colin Baker era, and some of those are – A little iffy, if not the books, then the stories. Yeah, we just finished on this show all of the season 22s that came out in the 80s. Obviously, the novelization of Revelation of the Daleks was substantially delayed, so that's not going to be discussed for a long time in the event that I get to the 21st century (laughs) targets. But some of those were better than others. Many of them were just slogs, so... Time Lash, for example, was – I had a guest who was very enthusiastic about it and brought a nice contrarian take. But for me, that was not the most fun read that I've uh, that I've had. So one thing I was hoping is that you and I would release an episode about the same book on the same day because <laughs> I got to the Peter Davison books in publication order just about the time that you got to the Peter Sa- – the, the Peter Davison books and story order, but it's never happened that we've released no. the same book on the same <laughs> Sunday. It hasn't. And come to think of it, I had Jim Sangster on my show a couple of times and he said, oh yeah, we're going to be doing that in a couple of weeks. I was like, yeah, I, I knew we were synchronizing at some point, but actual synchronization was always going to be tricky. And now we're drifting further and further out of sync. Well, There are two exceptions to that. Number one, Jim is the common link between our two shows because if you look at our shows in release order, he has been on either one of our shows almost every week for the last six months. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) He does get around our Jim. (laughs) He is phenomenal. I could not have done this show as long as it did without his help. And um, between his music and his frequently guesting and his being a producer and giving me ideas, I could not do the show without him or without Dave Barsky, my other producer. But uh, Jim recently wrapped up a run where he was like six out of 12 books or something like that. So yeah, definitely could not do it without him. Right. Yeah. Just as I couldn't do it without Dalton and Allison on our show. So you have, in story order, you have five seasons to go. You have the two Colin Baker seasons and the three Sylvester McCoy seasons. But 
four of those five seasons is where the show dropped down to only four serials per year. Yes. So what that means in actuality is you only have, I think, 21 books left, which is on your biweekly schedule, less than half a year. Well, we actually have a slightly more than that <clears throat> because we're also going to be doing the uh, – I can't remember what that range of books is called. The Lost Stories, the ones that were novelized from the Colin Baker season that did not happen. So there are those three. And we're also doing Slipback, which – I'm still waiting for somebody to talk me out of, but it is going to happen. We're also going to be doing Jim Sangster's own novelization of Dimensions and Time. Again, I'm waiting for somebody to talk me out of that. And then once we're done with those, we're actually going to tackle all of the newer Target books that have been released for the new series. So there's a significant number of those, but yeah, it's, it's definitely going to be at least probably another 10, 15 on top of the targets that we're doing. So we're going to be at this for a little while. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I'm going yeah. to be covering those as well. So I'm going to be covering Slipback. And I will say that Slipback is one of the few target books that I've never, ever read. I did not really? collect that in the wild in the 1980s. And then when I finally bought it. Having had bad experiences with so many other Eric Sayward books, I couldn't be bothered to read it. So it's been sitting <laughs> in its original dust jacket, the little plastic wrap that I bought it in at Galley several years ago. Oh, so I'll wow. be reading that for the first time within the next few weeks because it's coming up real soon on this show in publication order. It it has its moments. I will give it that. <laughs> But you're right, it is an Eric Sayward book, ultimately, and as we've seen in recent years, Sayward could be erratic, just a bit. Are you, or did you already many years ago, cover The Pescatons, which is a Tom Baker-era novelization of a vinyl release of a story written by Victor Pemberton that desperately wants to be a Patrick Trout novelization, but isn't? We did indeed. As a matter of fact, pescatons is a dirty word on our podcast. I mean, <laughs> we have lots of dirty words on our podcast, but pescatons is the one that will actually cause Allison and Dalton both to swear under their breath because we hated that book for lots of reasons. One of them being it is indeed a second Doctor book in the uh, wolf's clothing of a fourth Doctor novel, and it's not even all that great uh, second Doctor book either. Which is unfortunate because Fury from the Deep is just a phenomenal Target book in many ways. And if you judge the quality of a Target book by the number of listens or downloads that I get, Fury from the Deep is a lot more popular than many of the other books that came out a few months on either side of it. But maybe the magic was running out for Victor Pemberton by the time he got to the Pescatons in the early 90s. I'm certain that was. <laughs> they were desperate to novelize anything. I'm surprised that Target didn't end up novelizing Exploration Earth because <laughs> it certainly was a Doctor Who audio and they could have and luckily they didn't. I don't want to get too deep into spoilers because I am also going to be devoting three weeks of my show to the missing season 23 books. And that will be as they come out in publication order rather than any sort of thematic order and not all three back to back to back. But I have read all three of those at various points in the past. And those are the moments that make you question, was my fandom worth it? Was all the money that I spent on these things and all the time that I spent <laughs> watching downtime or reading the paradise of death or reading doctor who and the ultimate evil. Oh. Is this what I want to be doing with my life? I, these, are, these are books that caused me to have deep existential crises for a few hours. Yeah. And understandably so. And come to think of it, I'm glad you mentioned downtime because I did think briefly about possibly doing that one. And then I lay down for a while and felt better about it. <laughs> and the same thing with I'm look at it this way, Jason, at least we never have to read a novelization of Doctor Who, The Ultimate Adventure. Oh, unless, of Never course, we go into Big Finish and cover the Big Finish audio adaptations of classic series properties. True. Well, I, I think Jim Sangster should probably novelize that. I mean, if he can if he can make a silk purse out of a sow's ear with dimensions and time, he should be able to tackle that stinker and actually do something good with it. 
the novelization of Downtime is good. I mean, number one, it's by Mark Platt, who couldn't write a terrible book um, if he tried. Agreed. And it does give us a lot of value-added material. So it takes about like 80 pages for the actual plot of the video to begin. I don't have malice towards the book per se, but watching the video sure. was, again, very good people – tried to make that and very good people appeared in it and nobody sets out to say i want to make the worst doctor who that i can <laughs> it's just the way that everything came out in the wash between uh production quality and pacing and stuff that was in the missing adventure novelization but not on screen mm -hmm. it, it was just a moment of, uh, of deep hurting and ditto for shakedown i'm very fond of the new adventure shakedown by terrence dicks i am yes. less fond of shakedown the 60 minute audio uh, it's video i should say it's awful you're absolutely right and again it has a stellar cast and yet <laughs> it, it's just painful but you're right shakedown the book itself you at least have a good what 60 to 70 pages before the video starts then the video is the middle section and then you have another 60 afterward and again i've thought about doing that one too but it's like how do you justify that i mean it is a novelization and we've done virgin publications before but could we call it a technically target at that point is that possible even <laughs> It is a question that I've been grappling with, I can assure you, because as I ponder on how much time this show has left, there are many ways that I could extend it. I could cover all the 21st century targets, including the Eric Sayward novelizations, including the David Fisher rewrites of Terrence Dick's novelizations, which were – there was certainly an effort on David Fisher's part, but I'm not positive that his writing style is – so much better than Terrence's to merit 180 pages each. Hmm. And then, of course, you have all the novelizations of the new series stories between Rose and The Giggle, some of hmm. which, like my guest last week, was James Goss. And, of course, it doesn't get much better than his novelization of The Giggle. Agreed. But some of the other ones in between are books of a series that doesn't quite have the same value for me that the classic series has. So – I'm not positive I want to spend several months just on those. And then do I – in between, do I go into the Virgin and BBC books that are novelizations such as Shakedown, Downtime, Scream of the Shalka, et cetera? Well, and I'm glad you mentioned Scream of the Shalka because we're definitely going to be doing that one. But as far as the David Fisher ones, I, I'd suggest doing them. We did them, and we found – absolutely what you thought was the case with androids of tara it's not much of an improvement because the story is still the story his version of stones of blood is actually quite an improvement as for eric sayward's dalek novelizations we just completed one of those and uh yeah there were problems we had issues <laughs> on one of the dvd releases there was a documentary about the eighth doctor adventure books and i forget which dvd this was on and i, I know it's been a minute since i watched it oh i remember this too but which they one? had justin richards on as one of their guests mm -hmm. and he was because he took over the line as editor in the year 2000 and he steered it through right until the end when they ended up stopping the eighth doctor series because the new series came out Mm -hmm. And now they were going to be doing ninth and 10th Doctor books, of which Justin Richards was a very early writer. So there was no longer a need for the EDAs as EDAs. The past Doctor Adventures went on for another six months, but the EDAs disappeared because of the new series. So Justin Richards is talking about sales figures for the last couple of years worth of books. And he said that an Eastern European orphanage had ordered the books in bulk. <laughs> Okay. And he was pleased because – I'm paraphrasing here, but he was very pleased because he imagined lots of Eastern European youths between the ages of 8 and 13 learning how to read English because of Doctor Who. Uh -huh. And then it turns out that the books were being purchased as kindling. <laughs> <laughs> Which brings oh. us back to the Eric Sayward novelization of Resurrection <laughs> of the Daleks. It is my firm hope that in Siberia, many cold, cold winters are warmed by stoves that are burning copies. 
of Doctor I, Who and the Resurrection of the Daleks by Eric Sayward. I know of at least one Chicago house that was warmed by burning a copy of it. <laughs> because it happened recently, but yeah, yeah, I agree with you. It That does seem just a little mean. And I, I wonder about the logistics about that. Why did they order that particular series in bulk? Is that they just had a lot of unsold copies that they were able to provide? Or was it that they couldn't find enough Where's Waldo books? What was the calculation there? It is quite possible that Justin was being a little bit facetious. I could see that. I could see that. <laughs> what I would like to do after Doctor Who literature runs its course is I desperately want to go back and do the full Hartnell. I want to watch the entire Hartnell era, starting mm. with the unaired pilot and going all the way through an adventure in space and time. And that, in my envisionment, is a weekly series. And I have guests on for four weeks at a time, sometimes overlapping serials. And I just watch each week as it would have been in the 1960s, where you're not worried about future continuity, where you're not saying, oh, this is going to be turned into a mini sequel for the new series 60 years from now. Just watching the show unfold and trying to figure out where it's going. Of course, the fact that I'm excited about doing a podcast about television made between 1963 and 1966, a good <laughs> chunk of which no longer exists as moving video, I'm not positive that's going to be an audience grabber. So, Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I, I've thought about what to do after our series ends, too, and I toyed with doing new adventures, but that had already been done. The Eighth Doctor Adventures, those have already been done. Maybe the Missing Adventures. And at one point I even thought for a moment about doing the Star Trek books from Publication Order. But there are so damn many of them, and I'd really rather not be doing this on my deathbed. Michael Hickerson, who is one of my listeners, also has a blog, and he's been going through the Star Trek books and those were put out by pocket from the late 70s on we're mm -hmm. beginning with the gene roddenberry novelization of the motion picture now he's the credited author i'm not positive that he was the actual writer but he was the credited author i have discussed this with one of my other guests i think he may actually have written that although i remain doubtful but then pocket had a long run of target books going all the way into the 1990s which then segued into the Star Trek The Next Generation line. So that's a lot of books to cover. Uh, you're, you're right. That'll definitely be the geezer edition of our respective shows. <laughs> yes, exactly. it would be on our 70s or 80s by the time we finish that. We did do an April Fool's edition once where we did the very first piece of published Star Trek fiction. And that would have been, oh, God, why am I blanking out on this right now? I want to say Gold Key, but it's not. There was the Gold Key comics. I have <laughs> those on... I bought the Gold Key comics on CD-ROM at about the time that the first J.J. Abrams movie came out, and some of those are awful. But there was also – there was Spock Must Die by James Blish. Yes. And then there was another book that I bought at a used bookstore in Montreal several years ago, which I have in the other room but not far enough from my microphone flex to reach. I think it's called Spock the Messiah. Yep. Spock the Messiah. Exactly right. Yeah, well, anything by James Blish. I mean, James Blish was basically the Terrence Dix of Star Trek novels. And amazing. Absolutely amazing. But I'm just looking right now to find out what the name of that book was. And sure enough, I think you're right that uh, Spock Messiah was the first one. But there was one before that, and I cannot remember now what it was. But if you go to our website and look for the April Fool's special, that's what we're covering. And we're doing it in exactly – we did it in exactly the same format that we would do a Star Trek book podcast if we were doing one. I found it. Mission to Horatius, 1968. Wow, I don't think I even have that one. Yeah, it's, it's for kids. It's very much for kids. It was, in fact, published by Whitman. Do you remember the hardcover Whitman books that were published up through the uh, late 70s? I'm not positive that I 
do, but I am now on the Wikipedia page for Mission to Horatius. It's got a very good cover art, I'll say that much. Oh, yeah. And it had a very good author. It's Mac Reynolds. And he's his name has fallen into obscurity now, but he was a really well-known science fiction writer in the 60s. And for them to have gotten his services in 1968 for this is really saying something. That being said, the book itself, uh, um, yeah, <laughs> the fact that we'd be doing Spock Must Die next and the James Blish novelization, I'd, I'd be more than up for doing it if I'm still around by then. Yeah, if you look at Mac Reynolds' Wikipedia page, he had a remarkably long series of sci-fi short stories from the 50s through the 70s for all the magazines that were in print at the time. And those magazines are pretty much all faded away one by one by one. But yeah, he was right there. He's he's a very good name to get. Oh, yeah, absolutely. The Gold Key comics fascinate me because they were doing long-running comic series for all of the 1960s American sci-fi shows. They did a long run for Star Trek. Mm -hmm. They did a run for Twilight Zone. And they did, I think, a 36-issue run for Dark Shadows, which Danny Horn covered in passing on the Dark Shadows Everyday blog, which I discovered he through did. you. Yes. As, I go, as I'm doing my Dark Shadows rewatch now, I'm up through episode 571 doing two a night. Every so often as I read the Danny Horn blog, there's your name in the comments. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I was addicted to that because I was going through my own watch of Dark Shadows at the time. And yeah, that blog got me through some very difficult nights, let's say, because that show's not always easy to watch. I mean, not in terms of emotion, but in terms of just getting through it. I'm sure there are many episodes I fall asleep during. That's actually been happening to me lately, because I'm in the episode 500s now. So the 1975 time travel arc covered oh. about five months of real time 95 episodes and it's amazing and then when they get back to the present which is the episodes made in 1968 they have a lot of balls in the air so there is the witch angelique who was responsible for barnes becoming a vampire mm -hmm. she returns to the present day and she's joined by her boss, Nicholas Blair, who may or may not be an avatar of the devil. Right. And he wouldn't even be the first character on Dark Shadows who is a villain named after the devil because Burke Devlin was the very first antagonist <laughs> right. on the show back to episode one. Then both the first Burke and the Nicholas Blair actors are so much fun to watch because they bring an energy to the show that many of the other soap opera actors of the late 1960s are not able to match. Absolutely. But there are so many subplots going, including the Dream Curse subplot, which I know nearly cost Danny Horn his will to live. <laughs> yes. Uh, he wasn't the only one. And come to think of it, I'm, I'm glad you're mentioning that for two reasons. One, I'm looking across my room right now and seeing the Viewmaster viewer set that was done for Dark Shadows that comes from that storyline, the one with Angelique and um, the other character you just mentioned who may or may not be the devil. It's from that storyline. And the other reason that I, um, I'm glad you brought it up is because the actress who played Angelique, we just lost her this year. Lyra Parker, yes, she died very, very recently. Yeah, I had just put out a video about uh, the Night Stalker on my YouTube channel, That 70s Review, and she was the villain in one of the episodes. So it's like, ah, oh, this is this is such a tragedy. But she did have a quite long run, so, and we still have those episodes to watch. I did purchase at a used bookstore in Providence, Rhode Island last summer all 32 Dark Shadows novels. And those came out from a company that was called Paperback Library, and they specialized yes. in gothics. And they were coincidentally headquartered in a Manhattan office building where I practiced law for several years, about 20 years ago. Oh, wow. Okay. Although my firm moved out of that address, and it was taken over by a bank. And obviously, Paperback Library, several acquisitions later, is now under a different name elsewhere in Manhattan. But this used bookstore in Providence was selling all 32 of them at $2.50 each. So oh. at that price, it would have been irresponsible to not buy them. <laughs> 
But I cannot imagine that a podcast covering all 32 of those books is going to have even the same reach that a Target novelizations podcast is going to have. And in fact, I did consider that for a while. I thought about it and I was like, no, 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 no. (laughs) That would be too... For one thing, we're talking about, as you said, a very niche audience already. And it would also be torture because Marilyn Ross, the uh, and I cannot remember the gentleman's name, but that's actually the uh, nom de plume of a male writer who wrote all of them. Yeah, he's an OK writer, but when it comes to Dark Shadows... It may as well be in a different universe. These stories do not exist in the Star in the uh, Dark Shadows universe at all, and probably shouldn't. He was working from the series Bible. Yep. And that was Art Wallace. So the first several books, Colin Wood on TV is Colin's house, and the geography is different. And obviously, there's a lot more exteriors because when you're writing a book, you're not confined to a small TV studio in the West 50s in Manhattan, as Dark Shadows was. And he has a different cast of characters, so the Collins family is a little bit bigger. And it takes him a while to cycle Barnabas Collins in, because Barnabas famously didn't join until the show had already been on for a year and was on the verge of cancellation. Mm -hmm. And the books were not... The Targets basically taught a generation of of British youth how to read. And it Mm -hmm. created the next generation of television executives in the UK. I don't think the Dark Shadows books served that purpose in the States because they were aimed at the same kind of audience that would have been reading or that would have been watching Dark Shadows as a soap opera in the 1960s. So the books are more along the lines of bodice rippers minus actual bodices being ripped. They really are. And what surprises me the most about them is they have been reissued. And Catherine Lee Scott, who played Maggie, has done audiobooks of, ah, I want to I say all of them, but I'm almost certain that's not true. But she's done audiobooks of them. And it's like, ah, on the one hand, that sounds like a good investment and maybe a good time. On the other hand, I've read a couple of them. And I remember what Danny Horn has said about the ones that I didn't read. And I'm not sure I want to put myself through that torture. The thing is, Danny was writing his blog 10 years ago, and that was the heyday of snark. So (laughs) snark means that even if you like something, you have to be vicious to it in the name of the punchline. Of course. Because he was writing in the age of TV Without Pity and many, many other TV recap blogs, which unfortunately I believe have either they have stopped being made or I have just stopped reading them because my TV habits have changed and i no longer watch so much tv that i need a blog to help me keep track of where i am right but he was cruel to these books even when he enjoyed them because that's the nature of blogging so i am enjoying i'm reading through the books and i'm not reading them consecutively i'm only on the fourth book of the 32 that i bought last year because i have a weekly targets podcast so i have a lot of other reading to do on the side right but they, they are good books. They are well-written. They have interesting mysteries. And if they are a little bit samey, and if they are a little bit sideways to where Dark Shadows was, well, that's the way fiction was in the 1960s. I mean, the paperback market kind of sustained itself by putting out book after book out all these properties. Uh, they were novelizations for everything. I mean, they were even Twilight Zone novelizations. So it was a good industry niche to fill. I don't know if you quite see that anymore. But again, these were not written the way that Target – Target in the UK you know, created a generation of writers, and, and these books in the States did not, unfortunately. Yeah, but they're good. Yeah. For what they are, they're very good. Hmm. Not exactly Umberto Echo, but they are good books. <laughs> right. Speaking of books that are not that good, well, Tony, I've had you on for half an hour, and we have not <laughs> talked about the subject of the week. I was wondering why you were dodging it. Yes. <laughs> I was tempted to do what you do, which is read a series of fast facts about the Find Your Fate Valentine books and then artificially speed it up the way that you do. <laughs> what I was impressed to learn as a guest on your show is you are actually not digitally speeding up. You actually read the fast facts in that voice. <laughs> yeah, it's it's taken some doing and it takes a lot of caffeine. And, and the other fun to... fact is that when you say you know, someone who's been reading the target books since the 1970s, that would be me. 
when you see when you say that would be me in creepy reverb voice, again, that is your actual voice and not an electronic effect. It is indeed. It scares my students to death. I just wish I had better skills than that in the classroom. But yeah, thank you for thank you for acknowledging that, Jason. Nobody ever notices these things. <laughs> So I will give a brief biographical version. I had surgery done. I had abdominal surgery in February 1983. And that was the week that a 25-inch blizzard struck the New York City area and its surrounding suburbs. So I ended up being in the hospital a little bit longer than I thought. So I was in the hospital for about 10 days, missing a good chunk of fourth grade in the process. But because I was in the hospital and I was a kid, people kept bringing me gifts. So I got two of the original Bantam books, Choose Your Own Adventures. And those books started coming out in 1980. And I, for some, for whatever reason, didn't start reading them until I was in the hospital in 1983. So I was given Deadwood City and I was given Who Killed Harlow Thromby, which are two of the first seven or eight Choose Your Own Adventures. And I was hooked. And I probably read each story through on every possible track multiple times. So for the next 18 months, pretty much all that I was reading, ages 9, 10, and 11, were Choose Your Own Adventures and The Hardy Boys, which I had started a couple of years earlier. Oh, yeah. And then when I discover the Target books in January 1985, eventually The Hardy Boys and The Choose Your Own Adventures stopped being read. But I was an avid reader of the choose your own adventures those came out of new york publishing and those books sold like hotcakes if you look at any one of the first 20 choose your own adventures and there's still a very healthy secondary market for them on ebay mm -hmm. many of those books had a dozen printings within the first year which yeah. they were selling three or four times as fast as the target so that'll do very well for you as a publisher and as a writer and it was primarily two men writing them. It was Ray Montgomery and Edward Packard. Edward Packard's still around. He's 93 years old. He blogs about politics every single day, and he has great things to say about the trial that is going on in New York <laughs> City right now. They former prominent real estate developer. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. But there are... Those two guys went their separate ways publishing-wise, and there are still those original Choose Your Own Adventure books coming out now in a different format with a different publisher in two different strands. So the Choose Your Own Adventures became an industry phenomenon in the 1980s, and they've never really gone away. But what we're talking about today is a clone series. There were many clone Choose Your Own Adventure series. So the Choose Your Own Adventures were children's books, and they were developed from the way that Edward Packard would tell bedtime stories to his children. So you start off with a premise, and every book was in a different genre. There was science fiction, there was fantasy, there was archaeology, there was time travel. The very first Choose Your Own Adventure book is The Cave of Time, where you have a cave that can deposit you in various points in Earth history. But there are also books set in the future in outer space. There's a book that came out a few years on called Hyperspace, which takes place in hyperspace and features Edward Packard himself as a character. There are books that take place under the sea. There are books that take place entirely in the past. There are murder mysteries. There are westerns. There are sword and sorcery books. There are espionage books. So the Choose Your Own Adventures covered every possible genre. And then there were all the clone lines. Find Your Fate by Ballantine Books was able to license some of the properties that they had. So Find Your Fate put out James Bond Choose Your Own Adventures in the 1980s. They put out Indiana Jones' Choose Your Own Adventures in the 1980s, the first four of which were written by R.L. Stein, mm. who then developed Goosebumps in the 1990s. And speaking of books that sold like hotcakes, <laughs> that put him in the stratosphere. But Indiana Jones' books were an earlier step on his road to fame. And Ballantine Books also did a six-run Doctor Who series, Find Your Fate, Doctor Who. And we're here today to discuss number four, Mission to Venus by William Ems, which was released in October 1986. I am cheating a little bit because I am on November 1986 now, target-wise, but close but no cigar. <laughs> but this is not a target book. It's a different publisher in the States putting out licensed Doctor Who fiction, 
And their authors are some of the same authors who were writing Target books because they also had Pip and Jane Baker. This one is written by William Ems, mm -hmm. who wrote Galaxy 4, the novelization of which I covered fairly recently. But this is a choose-your-own-adventure type book that is a novelization of a failed William Ems script called The Imps mm -hmm. that would have come out in the space that became The Underwater Menace in 1967. Do you know why that story fell through? Uh, I, from what I've read... From what I've read, the reasons were because at one point he fell ill during the writing of the script. Then at another, he had Jamie McCrimmon added. Then he needed to come up with Ben and Polly leaving. And it just got to be such an issue that they finally had to abandon the story, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. If this book is anything to go by, it also would have been an unfilmable story not that yeah. underwater menace was easy to make <laughs> or easy to watch <laughs> <laughs> i am an underwater menace apologist but not necessarily <laughs> because i think it's the most perfect uh, gem of fiction ever written so this is fascinating because it's william m's taking this 20 year old idea soon after he novelized galaxy 4 but he's doing it in the choose your own adventure format so the cover illustration and there is a different cover in the UK, but we have the American version. Which is gorgeous. It is supposed to be Colin Baker. It looks nothing so much as Sylvester McCoy in the Colin Baker wig in the opening pre credit sequence to Time <laughs> on the Ronnie. Which is funny because when this came out, that had not been filmed yet. So right. that, couldn't, that couldn't be the answer. But it looks like Kevin, like a regenerating Sylvester McCoy rather than Colin Baker. Well, that's fine. The character in the book doesn't feel like Colin Baker either. So... <laughs> And the you in the Choose Your Own Adventure, or I should say the you in Find Your Fate, you are not playing the Doctor. You are playing the male companion alongside the Sixth Doctor and Perry. But given that this began life as a Second Doctor, Polly, and Ben script, the way that I chose to read this book, regardless of the cover art, I chose to read this as a Second Doctor book, and I am playing Ben Jackson. So every couple of pages I thought, oh. oi, the way that Ben would say. Yeah. And come to think of it, some of the choices that you're given as that character make perfect sense for them. Is, and I realize it's taken us almost 40 minutes to get to this point, and I'll just briefly segue a little bit further to save you the agony. So Bantam Books put out the Choose Your Own Adventures, and those ran for 184 books, and they ran for about 20 years. Ballantine Books put the Find Your Fates out, and those were branded. So they had, again, James Bond, Indiana Jones, Doctor Who. Pocket Books, which had the Star Trek license, and they were doing the original Star Trek novels that we've talked about, they put out Which Way Books. Mm -hmm. And there actually is a licensed Star Trek Which Way book. Star Trek, with a trademark on the cover, Star Trek Voyage to Adventure. And I had that. I bought my father bought that for me in the wild. Oof. But I lost it, so I've repurchased that off of <laughs> eBay for about five bucks. Oh wow. <laughs> Another one that I really enjoyed, and again, I'm a couple of years behind you. You might not have read these in the wild, but Bantam also had a second line called The Time Machine. Yeah. And those were a little bit longer, and those had appealing gray covers rather than the choose your own adventure white. And I had one where you're a pirate in the 18th century sailing around um, the West Indies. And then there was another one where you go back in time to visit the dinosaurs. And then there was another one where you're a samurai sword fighting in feudal Japan. That ran for 25 books. Oh, and I also had, looking at the list now, they also had a Civil War book, which I had, where you're trying to stop John Wilkes Booth, Civil War secret agent, hmm. written by Steve Perry, who was doing a lot of these. Um, so there was also the Dungeons and da Dungeons and Dragons did Endless Quest. So they also had Choose Your Own Adventures. And those came out from TSR, who were doing the D&D &D novels as well. So there were a lot of rival Choose Your Own Adventure lines taking up in the 1980s. I had a lot more Choose Your Own Adventures than anything else. But I also had some of the Endless Quests and some of the Which Way and some of the Find Your Fate. In fact, the Find Your Fate book... Indiana Jones book. I'm trying to recall the name. It was 
I think it was called the Vampire's Curse. You're trying to find Dracula's cup, which will give you immortal life. And if you reach the end of the book, you, as Indiana Jones' sidekick, are given immortality by drinking out of this cup. <laughs> it reminds me of nothing so much as the eventual plot of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> they were ahead of their time. Or were they or- behind the time at that point? Is Were just, you reading any of these books in the wild in the 1980s? No, <laughs> not at all. Because, again, I was probably a little too old for them at that point. I did look at the Doctor Who Find Your Fate ones. In fact, somewhere around here, I still have a copy of the first one. And that would be, I'm looking at it right now, uh, Search for the Doctor by David Martin. But... I didn't end up actually reading much of it. And I think it was because, yeah, this feels even more like a kid's book than any of the other kids' books created under the Doctor Who line. For that matter, speaking of of Dave Martin, the canine books that he wrote specifically for children in 1980, yeah, at at least they're not quite as basic as those. This one, at least, I have to say, Mission to Venus, it seems to be on a slightly higher level, though not by much. (laughs) I think I'm willing to give William M. some leeway because I actually like the novelization of Galaxy 4. I'm going to have you return the favor because when I'm on your show, I'm given the task of reading the back cover blurb. And you put fancy music under it, which I'm not going to do. But could you read us the back cover blurb for Mission to Venus? I absolutely can. The Doctor is counting on you, it's all caps, to help win a nerve-wracking game of trust, treachery, and terror in Mission to Venus. Traveling in the TARDIS, you and the Doctor materialize with a crash in a most unusual place, the belly of an in-flight spaceship. More eerie are the tall glass jars you find there, filled with jelly-like plants that desperately want out. But why? While the doctor ponders that question, you meet the crew. A suspicious, uh, (laughs) a suspicious, vicious, and mutinous lot. Try saying that five times fast. No, thank you. I'm not going to (laughs) try. Will they, review, will they reveal the plant's true purpose in the ship's destination? But that may not matter after all. The spaceship has been struck by an enormous meteorite, and now you're flying out of control on a collision course with Venus. There's precious little time for you and the Doctor and Perry, but they don't mention her, and perhaps everyone else. It will be a true test of your ingenuity to avoid becoming galactic statistics as you... Find your fate, because they put the trademark right underneath it. And I can hear your voice echoing as you say, find your fate. <laughs> I was about to say, you should, yeah, you should definitely put echo on that, because I'm out of voice today, and I wasn't able to do it myself. <laughs> Is Mission to Venus a good book? Is it worth paying $75 for on eBay? Because that is the going price right now, $75. Ah. <sighs> As a curio, as a collectible, for the completest only, it may actually be worth that price. If you are somebody who is reading it because you want to be a Doctor Who story completist and you want to know everything that's been published with the Doctor in it as a character, absolutely not. It's enjoyable to some degree, but oh goodness. (laughs) <laughs> the degree is very small. Like I said, I think I like this one better than the one that I tried to read before. And it's William M's, so occasionally he does these interesting little bits with the prose. But, yeah, I wouldn't say so. I wouldn't say so. I have been recollecting the Choose Your Own Adventures over the last couple of months. And I will give a shout out to Matt and Chris on the All New Adventures of the Doctor Who Book Club podcast. They did an episode about the Choose Your Own Adventures and the Find Your Fates a couple months ago, and that sparked my interest anew, because I had about 20 Choose Your Own Adventures in the 80s, 
and then I, whereas I kept all my targets, I lost all the choose your own adventures. I've been buying them back. The choose your own adventure format is each book is about 120 pages long. And each book has somewhere between 20 and 40 different endings. Mm. So you read a page. The setup is usually two or three pages with illustrations. And then you're given a choice. And then that diverges to almost an endless series of alterations. So depending on the path you take, you might never actually reach the subject of the book. Choose Your Own Adventure number 19 is called Secret of the Pyramids, but it's possible to read that book several times and never actually get to the pyramids because mm -hmm. there's other quests. Mystery of the Maya, which is one of the Choose Your Own Adventures that I had, one path will keep you in present-day Mexico City, which I don't believe is geographically accurate, in the 1980s, but the other path will take you back in time, where if you are not careful, you will wind up a victim of sacrifice. <laughs> so those are books that move. There's a choice every two or three pages. Yeah. The prose is pitched a little bit younger than the target books, so they're very easy to read. Let's do a quick comparison. I'm going to read the first two paragraphs of The Cave of Time, the very first Choose Your Own Adventure. This came out in 1979. Edward Packard, who again is still with us, and if you like American politics, I urge you to read his blog. Still updates it every day. And then after I read that, I'm going to have you read the first four paragraphs of Mission to Venus. Okay. And I will say that whereas the Choose Your Own Adventure books have small sections, Mission to Venus is divided only into 28 sections. And each section can run up to 10 pages. So the prose for me is not as zippy. No. This is the Cave of Time or the other CYOAs. Let's do a comparison. This is the key to time. Uh, so this is the Cave of Time. Oh, key to time. That's six minutes. It'll take a long time to read. This is the Cave of Time. You've hiked through Snake Canyon once before while visiting your Uncle Howard at Red Creek Ranch, but you never noticed any cave entrance. It looks as though a recent rock slide has uncovered it. Though the late afternoon sun is striking the opening of the cave, the interior remains in total darkness. You step inside a few feet trying to get an idea of how big it is. As your eyes become used to the dark, you see what looks like a tunnel ahead, dimly lit by some kind of phosphorescent material on its walls. The tunnel walls are smooth, as if they were shaped by running water. After 20 feet or so, the tunnel curves. You wonder where it leads. You venture in a bit further, but you feel nervous being alone in such a strange place. You turn and hurry out. This is very good prose for the age group. The sentences yes. are short, there's no run on sentences. It's written with a you are there immediacy. I am not positive that William Ems is capable of writing like that. So if you no. can read for us the first the first four paragraphs of this one. In fact, I'll give you the I'll give you the first five because that one ends on a line that's actually uh, will take us somewhere. <clears throat> you materialized with a dreadful crash. It hurled you all to the floor, and there was the sound of shattering glasses, gauges, and crockery surrendered to the inevitable. And this was the point where I said, I'm done. When <laughs> crockery appears in the second sentence of the book, I am no longer interested. This is not a word that leads you to adventure. Ooh, Doctor Who and the broken crockery. <laughs> anyway, back well, to you, Tony. It, it gets better, he said, knowing that he lied. Um <laughs> You sat up and rubbed your throbbing elbow, looking questioningly at the doctor. What did we hit this time? This time, the doctor gave you a cold stare. It doesn't happen all that often, you know. Too often for me, Perry said, tenderly touching her dark head, dark head, where it had connected too violently with some unmoving object. No editor would have allowed that to stay in today. No. I... Like, I tried to describe myself to my daughter last week as tall, dark, and handsome. She goes, you can't say that anymore. <laughs> Everybody said tall, dark, and handsome in the 80s. You, you can't say dark anymore. It no longer means what you think it means. No. Anyway, back to you. All right. The doctor rose slowly to his feet, as did you. These minor difficulties are to be expected, he said. Every time we materialize, something is displaced. It's quite simply the proposition of the object in the bathwater. Drop it in, and the water rises. And what, I wonder, did we drop into, Perry wondered, as she wincingly stood up, at which point I thought, I think I know what we dropped into. Oh, yeah. That's, 
that's the five the first five paragraphs because two of the paragraphs are no i'm sorry three three of those five paragraphs are one sentence long one of my writing professors as an undergraduate in the 1990s who himself was a short story author of some renown he told me two things number one never use exclamation points in your text mm -hmm. as a comic book reader i was putting a lot of exclamation points in my short stories he cured me of that habit secondly he said never ever ever use an adverb here in the first five paragraphs we have tenderly violently i don't know if william ems went to the same prose writing school as i did i can guarantee he didn't questioningly is another one that's three adverbs in the first half a page yeah truly madly deeply <laughs> he loves his adverbs <laughs> if alan rickman had, re had read this book maybe that would have been a, a different story so mm -hmm. The challenge that I gave you was to read this book three different times and see if you can make it through to the end. Mm -hmm. I read the book three different times, and when I reached my first death or dead end, when you die in the Choose Your Own Adventures, you're dead, often in horrifying ways. Um, in Inside UFO 5440, you might end up getting cut in half by a door. You might end up being sent into a million year slumber as punishment by the aliens who have abducted you. Uh, there was another one, I believe, called The Mystery of Chimney Rock, which is a haunted house story where you run into a witch who turns you into a mouse when you eat cursed cheese. <laughs> the Choose Your Own Adventure books know how to kill you. And this yeah. caused some controversy for school teachers because you're a nine year old dying in horrific ways. In Deadwood City, you're bitten by a rattlesnake or you're shot while cheating at cards. But those books end when you reach page 85 of The Cave of Time, the story is over, and you've got to go back to the beginning. One thing that I like about the Find Your Fates is when you reach an ending, it says you're dead, you didn't do very well, but here's what would have happened. Then it sends you back to the path you didn't take. Go to chapter, whatever it is. Yes. That actually is not that bad. My quibble is the sections are too darn long. Section 9 is 10 pages long that's just way too long to go without making a choice yes and in fact i need to interject here because we almost did this book on the doctor who target book club podcast because previously we had done another choose your own adventure doctor who book and that was an 11th doctor adventure which i believe was with the macra and we were doing it as a uh, part of a christmas special that worked well because those sections were short. William Ems could not write a short section to save his life. We finally gave up because we were like, this is way too long to read out loud on the podcast and then try to get through even one branch, let alone two. So assuming you read this book three times for this recording, did you make it all the way through to the only happy ending, which is section 28. And I'll point out the Choose Your Own Adventures have many happy endings. If there's 40 endings to a book, 20 mm -hmm. of them are positive. Here, there's only one way to finish properly. Did you reach the end? Because I did not. I did, but I went over three uh, because, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, I, I did it seven times. Yeah. I, wow. I went through um, because, as you said, it, this book kind of makes that easy to do because it says, oh, well, you certainly screwed up there. Why don't you go to 26 and see what you should have done, you dumb schmuck? And it's like, oh, OK, all right. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> and um, I, I, even jot, I even jotted down for your podcast, Jason, the different ways that the story ended for me. And wow. only one of them, oh, I'm sorry, two of them, two of them end in death. That's but what happened to stuff. me. I died two out of the three times. So section one is five pages long, which, again, too darn long. It shouldn't take that long to get to your first choice. No. And then the editor doesn't seem to know what the word choice means. When you get to the end of section one, if you're still awake, this <laughs> is a straight choice. And then it gives you three options. First of all, a straight choice is two options, yes or no. 
<laughs> Three options is not a straight choice. Agreed. Your options are befriend the sailor, smash the jar, which has a deadly plant in it, or wait and see. I decided to befriend the sailor my first time out. Then again, choose your own adventure books often had value judgments. If you did a choice that was morally wrong, you were going to die. Yeah. So I figured that smashing the jar was just absolute death. So I decided not to do that. Nor and then I. one of the ways that I would play Choose Your Own Adventure, I would, I would always pick the choice that was the lowest page number on the assumption of the longer it takes me to reach the end, the longer the story will go out. So, for example, if you had a choice between pages 11 and pages 87, I was picking page 11 every single time. Mm-hmm. That, that's a trap. Here, I, I figured that if you smash the jar, you're not going to make it out alive. Plus, that was section 11, much closer to the end. So I chose Befriend the Sailor, section 6. In that section, the sailor tells you a story about what a dystopian hellhole, hellhole you materialized in, and you take him and leave, and he becomes your third companion. Yeah. And then it says, the sailor simply wanted to desert, and you have inadvertently help, helped him. Don't believe everything you hear. Try again. Go to section four, which was the less awful choice of the first three you were given. That is a bad ending. I mean, yeah, you die two sections into the book. You're told you made the wrong choice, but you're never told why. You miss the adventure entirely. And yeah, w- w- why? That, that, that was my takeaway. So this, this was not a good first choice to make. Befriending the sailor is a good moral choice in the choose your own adventure verse, but in this book it leads you to death, and that just didn't do it. Didn't do it for me. Yeah, I found that if I always took the choice with the least amount of action, like wait and see, or just observe, see what happens. That generally led you through to a choice that you could actually get to the end of the book. But you're absolutely right. In fact, the one that you just did, Jason, I hadn't, I did not do that branch, and I just looked at it. And you're absolutely right. It not only very quickly ends the book for you, but you're told don't believe everything you hear. And that's absolutely right, because the sailor lies through his teeth to get on to the TARDIS, none of what he says is true, but you'd never know that unless you went back and did it again. But it does branch you off back to that choice. So at least there's that, but you're right. It's kind of awful that it ends that quickly. One of the Choose Your Own Adventure clone series that I didn't talk about earlier was a series of Choose Your Own Adventure sports books put out by Archway. And I believe Archway also had um, a stake in the Which Way book, so I'm positive that I recall at this point. Um, but the first of those books is Can You Win the Pennant? The third one is World Series Pressure, and the fifth one is Opening Day. So three of the first five are baseball. There were two football books in the mix, which I did not buy because I didn't follow football growing up. Those books were clever because there were three surprise endings that you could not predict. So I think 12 endings, you win the game or the World Series, 12 endings, you lose, and then three of them, something crazy happens. This is kind of like the equivalent of that, but I still contend that losing the book on the second turn on the very first choice is not good plotting. No, no, definitely not, and I wish I could say that that is the worst choice you have, but it gets worse. There are actually worse choices you could make, and some of them... Here's the thing that I really don't like about Mission to Venus. Something I didn't like about the 11th Doctor book that we did is that some of the choices seem to change the story itself. So the base story itself changed depending on what you did, so that you had a completely different plot, if that makes sense if you did this choice rather than the one that you were on where this was happening with this group of people and these enemies and what have you. Like the spaceship commander Burrigan, which is a terrible name. Try, oh, yeah. that, try saying that out loud. The first time you meet him, he is a villain and an antagonist. Later on, depending on which path you take, he's the best starship captain ever. So I'm like, wait, wait, wait a minute. Who is he? Oh my God. Yeah. Uh, not to jump ahead, but uh, Liam Ems has a big boner for Berrigan. <laughs> oh, because there is at least two pages of description 
about what a fine captain he is and what a form he cuts on the bridge. And, oh, he was made of stern stuff. And with a single bound, he was free. That level of writing, it's like, you're kidding me, right? This isn't going to go anywhere, is it? And sure enough, it doesn't. It's just he really likes this character that he's created. But yeah, same thing, same thing. And let me just quickly amend the sports books, Canyon, Win the Pennant, World Series, Pressure, etc. Those were put up by Archway. Archway was a division of Pocket Books that also did the Star Trek Which Way books. So I'll briefly correct what I said there. The second choice that I read, so terrible things befall the spaceship. A couple of crewmen are killed. There's a two-page detour where Bergen lectures his first officer on how to act in a crisis, which, um, again, that's not why you're – you're not reading a Doctor Who which way book to learn um, ethics on a sailing ship, but well, yeah. maybe, maybe, maybe you are. <laughs> but then you're given a choice of helping out when there's a hull breach or doing something else. Yes. And again, taking the choose-your-own-adventure – Edward Packard, Ray Montgomery style of doing the morally right choice, I decided to help the first officer repair the hull breach. It's the right thing to do and a tasty way to do it. Um, (laughs) It turns out that if you do that, after seven pages of that section, your character decides to start playing around on a space tether and you're in a spaceship whose communicator doesn't work. And the first officer who doesn't see you inadvertently severs your tethering line and doesn't hear you crying for help and doesn't see you drifting away slowly. And you end up dying in the colds of space because you offered to help the first officer repair a hull breach. That makes no sense. What the heck? Yeah, I got that one too. I got that one too. In fact, that was the, uh, was that the first choice I made? No, I think it was the second, but yeah, I got the exact same thing and thought, what? Seriously? I pulled a Turlo. It was awful. I was floating <laughs> through space and there wasn't another ship to pick me up. But again, it's one of those, well, you didn't do well there, did you? Go back to this and you can try again. It's like, oh, okay, fine. But if you were reading this as a choose-your-own-adventure, that would be a separate and distinct choice. Yes. If you choose to help the first officer, go to page 12. If you choose to dance around in space uh, on a space tether with a with a non-functioning communicator, go to page 107. Here, yeah. you're making the morally right choice, and then you die through no fault of your own under an action that you would never have taken if you were given the choice to do so. So this is where the find your fates fail, the choose your own adventure test. It's just too random. I appreciate a good death in a children's book, but this makes no sense because you didn't make the choice – you didn't make the morally wrong choice where you deserve to die and learn your lesson. Here it just happens. Yeah. And weirdly enough, though, that's still not the most random thing that can happen to you in this book. Which leads me to my third path. Aha. Uh-huh. <laughs> so after I died by choosing to dance in space, which, again, makes absolutely no sense, I die a horrible death in the cold freezing vastness of space and then I start over again I ended up you wind up going with your first officer to some other part of the ship I forget why and you end up in a locked room with Count Dracula of Transylvania (laughs) and his three brides of death and they lock the door And you're dead. Now, that was the third. I told myself I was only going to read this three times through. That was my third and final choice. I was not tempted to go back and read on. Begging the question, number one, how did Dracula get to a spaceship in the 25th century? Secondly, is Dracula in the rest of the book? Does Dracula become a good guy ally who helps you defeat the Legion, which are the space alien plants? Or is this just I have no idea how to end this section, so I'm going to throw in Count Dracula? Nobody's reading these anyway. Help me understand this, Tony. I think it's the third one. (laughs) Because here's the thing. I did not get that branch. I never ended up taking that path. After I finished the book, though, and in preparation for this podcast, because being in academia, I actually do my homework. I went back through the book to see what some of the paths were that I didn't take. And it turns out that I think there were only three I didn't. Because it's a very short book, as it turns out, and that's a good thing. 
Yes. The Dracula Path caught my attention because there's a terrible, terrible illustration with it. And I said, wait a minute, what? Did they just do the chase? And sure enough, they did. And this time they died. And it doesn't make any sense. This book has no page numbers. It only has section numbers. And like I said, some of the sections uh, go on forever. But the illustration, if you have this book, number one, my friends, if you have this book, sell it. 75 bucks <laughs> on eBay buys a lot of other things. I may just do that. <laughs> so the illustration of Dracula and one of his brides is on page 22. A much better illustration of Dracula is the 1980s teen sex comedy Once Bitten with a very young Jim Carrey where Lauren Hutton <laughs> plays an immortal goddess vampire in Los Angeles trying to find the one virgin high school student whose virgin blood will keep her in eternal youth. And Cleavon Little, many years removed from Blazing Saddles, plays Lauren Hutton's gay manservant, and it's probably the best acting performance he ever gave. I would watch that movie straight through three times just for Cleavon Little. But that is a very good bad Dracula story. This is not, but the illustration of Dracula and one of his brides, who seems to be cosplaying as Bette Midler on the <laughs> section 22, this is not a good illustration of Dracula. And no offense to William M's, no offense to the author or the artist who tried very hard. What does this have to do with Mission to Venus? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And what what makes it even worse, and this is something that doesn't make any sense to me either, I do not remember the Choose Your Own Adventures well enough to remember if they had illustrations. I assume they did. They did. The illustrations were half a page. Uh, Cave of Time, pages 8 and 9, the illustration goes across both pages, and it's a panoramic view of the prehistoric past. Hmm. and there's text on the bottom of page 8 and the bottom of page 9, and there's a choice at the bottom of page 9. There's simple line drawings. Um, the early ones are done by Paul Granger. But if you read the biography, this is back when being a book artist was a viable career path, which it no longer is because of the disintegration of publishing. The, the authors, the illustrators they got on the Choose Your Own Adventures were prize-winning illustrators with long pedigrees. The illustrator for Find Your Fate is named as Romas, R-O-M-A-S, and I couldn't find anything about that. That's too hard to Google. <laughs> well, uh, weirdly enough, I looked, and it said interior illustration copyright Gail Bennett, and that name I do know, because Gail Bennett was, if I remember correctly, a fan artist, and one of the things that she did, if I'm if I'm remembering this wrong, I apologize to your listeners, sometimes this happens, but Gail Bennett did a poster of the fourth Doctor in the mode of toulouse Lautrec. I may be wrong about that, though. I think instead Gail Bennett may actually have done some illustrations for some fanzines. This looks more like a fanzine illustration to me, and not a good one. But the, pro the reason why I asked if there were illustrations in those original books is because I would assume if you have an illustration in a book where you're choosing paths, you put the illustration in the section that it goes with. The the Dracula section is the end of section 21, and it then it tells you you should go back to 5. So you're not going to read on to 22. The Dracula illustration is in section 22, which is the other path, which is the circus path, which I also did not take, thank God. Because for some reason your character ends up in the circus. An article of faith among Choose Your Own Adventure readers under the age of 15. If you died in the book, you were going to cheat your way out of it. So, for example, page 63 on the Cave of Time, you are killed by a boa constrictor. And there's an illustration of you lying on a forest floor with your feet waving in the air, shoelaces undone, being throttled to death by a boa constrictor. But it's right there on the page. Right. Here, as you say, Dracula, page uh, section 21, if you follow the instructions and turn back to an earlier section of the book, you will not see that illustration. And, of course, I didn't see it until you pointed it out to me. And another point is there are some choose-your-own-adventure books that you can only win by cheating because the authors knew that kids were going to cheat. Yeah. 
So inside UFO 5440, the happiest possible ending is you're taken to paradise, but it warns you on the inside cover the only way to get to paradise is not to make a choice. So you only get there by accidentally turning to the wrong page, page 101, <laughs> or by just cheating and flipping through the book and finding it. Wow. That is something. But here, this is a cheat on top of a cheat, because the only way to find the illustration of Dracula is to cheat, is to cheat or pick a different path which Dracula is not in. Yes, in a nonsensical path. So talk and, to us about the circus ending. How do you get to the circus, and what does that have to do with a short story about a spaceship on Venus? How do you get to a circus practice? Um, well, not in this case. Um, in fact, here's the other thing about I remember about Choose Your Own Adventures, that you could backtrack a little more easily than you can with this. So I do not know what branch actually takes you to Section 22, but in Section 22 you are suddenly in a circus – seemingly in the 20th century and there is a three page long uh story about how you became part of the circus and that's it that's exactly what it is that's Had, certainly a thing that can happen i'm just not sure how it fits into the into the text of the story it doesn't because the first line is the directions the doctor's mind took were sometimes beyond belief dot 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 and that's the last mention we have of the doctor so with the choose your own adventures there are many happy endings if a book has 40 endings 20 of them are going to be positive the only way to win Find Your Fate Mission to Venus is to get to Section 28, and I confess I never got there. But I did cheat to read the final section to see how the story is supposed to end. Yes. And it's a seven-page section, which, come on, too long now. But <laughs> the illustration on the first page of Section 28 is two race cars crashing into each other just behind a checkered flag. Yes. And again, this story takes place on a spaceship en route to Venus with murderous carnivorous plants, how do you wind up on the Indy 500 in space? So I did backtrack and I cheat read section 27. Yep. The sphere drew you into a dream and dot, dot, dot. You watched impatiently as the mechanics raced to repair and replace the wheels of your racing car. Time was against you. You'd been holding the lead until you'd hit some of the wreckage from an earlier smash. Now the German ace, Hildenbrau, stood every chance of winning. And that with only three laps for you to go. Curse that wreckage. The car was a beauty. Its lines sleek and blue, but you were not in love with it at that moment. Number one, that's terrible prose. Secondly, where's the mission to Venus in this? And then you end up getting killed on the very next page. And then it sends you back to section 14 to try again. I mean, I appreciate randomness and I appreciate humor, but <laughs> come on yeah. now. Well, at least you didn't get the endings where you end up a pirate or as the Scarlet Pimpernel or on stage in a 20th century play, which is about a 23rd century science fiction story in which you end up dying because you are stabbed to death by a stage knife that goes faulty. And then there's the ending where you end up saving humans from rebel robots, which is its own thing, too. Some so, of yeah. these sound artistically pleasing and creative, but it sounds as if it's 20 different choose-your-own-adventure books with 20 endings from 20 different books put together in the same story. I suspect William Ems did not understand the concept, the core concept if we were watching Archer. The core concept, obviously. He he doesn't seem to have gotten it. He seems to think that instead of giving you choices within the story, the choices can simply because I guess you're breathing in the gases that these creatures that they're actually transporting the Venus is giving off, that that allows you to do some craziness. And that's fine. I'm, I, I'm a Doctor Who fan. I'm on board with craziness. I'm fine with it, to a point. Like the Deadly Assassin. If you were to turn the Deadly Assassin into a choose-your-own-adventure book, you could be stabbed to death by a mad surgeon in the middle of a desert. You could be scared to death by a clown. You could be run over by a train, a la The Perils of Pauline. Mm -hmm. You could fall off a cliff. You can drink poison and die. You can be strangled. 
that's fun. It works in the context of the Deadly Assassin, which is very early cyberspace. I'm not so sure that getting killed by Dracula or falling off a space tether or dying in a race car crash is dramatically satisfying in a story called Mission to Venus. Yeah. This felt more like having a sudden musical number in the middle of a Christmas episode. (laughs) And there were some Christmas specials in Doctor Who that really could have used a musical number. I won't name names. Yes, true. And one that could have done just as well without. But... (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what this book feels like. It is all over the place. And I can't necessarily say, having done the whole thing and actually going within the main plot, that the main plot is all that well, is all, all that better. Because ah, this this bit with the plants, then the imps, because that's the name of the script that he would have turned into a Patrick Troughton story. I. Ah, It's all over the place in a way that, I have to say, makes Galaxy 4 look tightly plotted. (laughs) And Galaxy 4 is tightly plotted. There's only two spaceships. Yeah. There's only one proper guest character, MAGA. Mm -hmm. There is a very clear through line. This planet is going to explode the day after tomorrow. How do we get off? Yeah. I cannot imagine in the original pitch for the imps. Now, Terrence Dix once quoted Raymond Chandler as saying, if you don't know where your detective story is going, just write the following. All of a sudden, the door flew open and three men with machine guns came charging in. (laughs) That's great for hard-boiled detective fiction in the 1930s. Raymond Chandler made a living out of it. I'm not positive that... If you're writing a 23rd century <laughs> spaceship and you're out of plot ideas, all of a sudden Dracula shows up or all of a sudden you're killed in a race car crash in the Indy 500. I can't imagine the plot of the imps feature that. The episode three cliffhanger and then Dracula showed up. Do-do-do-do-do. Yes. And there's something else that is a problem for this book. And I don't remember it ever being a problem for the one or two choose your own adventure ones that I read. Uh, two of the story branches come to the same spot. Huh. And I, yeah, and I don't know how that's possible. I thought that these books were designed so that that wasn't the case, but I ended up doing one twice. And that was being on stage in the 20th century and the one uh, saving humans from rebel robots. Now, the Time Machine series... That was a, we mentioned it earlier, it's a shorter lived companion to the Choose Your Own Adventures, also put up by Bantam Books. In the Time Machine books, you have a time machine on your wrist. Hmm. And there's also a study guide giving you historical data about the period you're visiting. So you can never make the wrong choice, and there's only one path to the end. And because you have an instant escape hatch on your wrist, you never die. So in those books, you may end up reliving the same scene three or four times until you get to the end but it's impossible to die. In a book like this, you should not read the same section twice. That's just the fault of the editor, I assume, or whoever was plotting out the various paths. Yeah, and you definitely should not be reading the same section twice in a book like this where it's not so great to watch it, uh, read through it to begin with. So this is only number four out of six. They only did six of these And then the line discontinued. There were, I think, two or three times as many of the Indiana Jones. I don't know if the sales figures for these were particularly robust. By the time the line ends, it's 1987. So the initial wave of Doctor Who fandom in the States would have been dying off by this point because you'd already seen the Tom Baker story seven times each. You're now getting to a less good portion of this. So there are defenders of seasons 22, 23, and and 24, but... Regardless of their defenders, the stories are objectively not as entertaining as the early Colin Baker or Peter Davis stuff. So the initial wave of Phantom is dying out. The TV stories are starting to get a little bit stale. I was 11 at the beginning and 14 by the time that I saw Time in the Ronnie on television, which almost broke my Phantom forever in March 1988. (laughs) <laughs> so these books probably ran their course. There's only six of them. And then I imagine they just stopped because the fans weren't there anymore. 
having read some of the other books on the series, are all six of these worth reading? And are some of the other books better told than this one, either in terms of prose or pacing or dramatically satisfying choices? Hmm. I don't know. And the only the only reason I don't know is because I've only tried reading Search for the Doctor and I didn't get through it, though I can see it across the room on my bookshelf. So maybe I should give it another try because it at least has Omega and Drax in it and K-9, oddly enough. Here's the thing. Looking on Goodreads, it tells you the amount of the number of editions each book gets. This went through three printings. Huh. Yeah, I've got the first edition, but it went through another two printings. The only one of those six books that only got one edition is Garden of Evil by Dave Martin. The others had at least two, and in some cases, three editions. Search for the Doctor went through four editions. Whereas so, my copy of The Cave of Time, I have the 11th printing in June 1981. Mm-hmm. That's 11 printings in 24 months, because the original came out in July 79. So yeah. three printings is good, but it's not choose your own adventures good. The sales figures weren't as robust as the CYOAs. Absolutely not. In fact, I'm wondering, given the fact that Garden of Evil was the third book out of six, I'm wondering if the sales on that were really bad, and that's why they only did the one printing. But the sales were better on the later ones, but they'd already decided to cancel the series. Mm. I I wish somebody would do an actual documentary for one of the Blu-ray sets about this set of books, because I would be fascinated to know what the mental calculus was going into these, because just based on this one, whoever was doing the writing, William Adams has written Colin Baker as if he's the first doctor. It doesn't quite work. It doesn't feel like the doctor. Perry feels like the doctor exactly once, and that's when she has a fight with the with the doctor. <laughs> yeah, I, I got to that section, yes. Yeah, that's the only time. And also, here's another point. If I'm playing a choose-your-own-adventure Doctor Who book, don't you want to be the doctor? Why would you want to be second companion from the left? Yes, exactly. The entire time I was like, okay, I guess this could work in an alternate continuity where Turlo stayed with them. So I'm playing Turlo, which somewhat appealed but yeah but i'm reading these stories for the man in the blue box and the doctor's not even in every section so when you are getting killed by dracula he's not there when you are dying in the freezing void of space he is not there so the doctor doesn't even save you no there is exactly one action that the doctor takes that moves the story forward And that's when, in the last section of the book, he murmurs to the navigator to plot a course for this so that they can scare the imps off the ship so that they can actually get to Venus because he convinces them it's going to be a collision course. That's the one thing I could see that was actually the doctor saying, let's do this, and it actually furthers the plot. It was the same with the Indiana Jones and the Indiana Jones Find Your Faith that I read. And it wasn't my copy. It was my cousin's copy. And I read it at his his house in the 80s. You're playing Indiana Jones's sidekick. So I think editorially, I should be playing the Doctor. And I will say that in the FASA role-playing books, and there's only two of those, Doctor Who and the Vortex Crystal, Doctor Who and the Rebel's Gamble. In those books, you are the Doctor. Mm Mm-hmm. This, however, if I were the editor of the series, there's a lot of things that I would have done differently. But I don't think they counted on these books still being read 40 years later. And I don't think they counted on the books going for $75 a piece on eBay. (laughs) So, Tony, we're just about out of time. Obviously, we can find you on the Target book club podcast and hopefully that runs for a long time or hopefully you segue into another show which is better than my heart and idea where else can we find you on online uh you can find the doctor who target book club podcast at tinyurl.com forward slash y m j b s a f six and as for the 
on I'm sorry, as for my YouTube channel, the that seventies review, you can find us and I'm sorry, I'm looking for it really quick because I wasn't anticipating having to do this. Oh my god. It is youtube.com forward slash Emperor Dalek. And if all else fails, as it inevitably will, yes. can we email you? You can email me at dwtargetbc at gmail.com. Borrowing one of my favorite lines from your show. <laughs> Which, when I remember to deliver it, sometimes I'm in a good mood and I forget to do it. <laughs> and I use my Direction Point podcast trailers in order. I have seven of them, so I do one a week every seven weeks unfortunately we have not synced up so your trailer is not running during this episode oh but i do shit. urge folks to check out that show even episodes that i am not in absolutely absolutely thank you for that plug because they're they're not nearly as good as the ones you're in but some of them almost get there unlike mission to venus which unless you're very very lucky never gets you to venus at all <laughs> All right, Tony, thanks so much for joining me, and hopefully we'll have you back on again real soon. Thank you very much. Enjoy being here. The vervoids are probably the best dirty joke in Doctor Who. They're hermaphroditic plants. A lot of plants are. So there you go. That's see, it's based on science. No, they'll ship anything. There are probably 11 and handle shippers out there. You just have to drill a hole where his mouth is, and you're all set. You know he needs the room. I've seen it in pictures. I'm not saying you're not a fan. I'm saying you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Doctor Who gives a fuck. A drunken Doctor Who podcast for the end times. You are listening to Doctor Who Literature. Keep turning the pages! Next time on Doctor Who Literature, as promised, we reach the end of 1986. We'll be talking about the final Target novelization to cover the Ice Warriors. This is also written by Terence Dix, as was the previous Ice Warriors novelization, The Monster of Peladon. It is one of the last stories of the Patrick Troughton era, one of the last times that we saw the second Doctor and Jamie and Zoe on screen. It is not the final novelization of Season 6. That would be The Space Pirates, which is coming up towards the end of the run of Doctor Who literature, being one of the last Target novelizations full stop. It is 148 pages of Terence Dix. Terence was doing very short books for most of the late 70s and early 80s, but at 148 pages, Terence has a lot of room to do his trademark genius work, and that results in a book that is much more entertaining than you would think it has a right to be, because it is the novelization of Doctor Who, The Seeds of Death. Joining me next week in a conversation recorded live at Gallifrey One over dinner is Mark from the Trap One podcast, one of the best friends this show has ever had, and Mark and I will be diving right into the seeds of death. Thank you for joining me on another episode of Doctor Who Literature. The executive producer of the Doctor Who Literature podcast is David Barsky. This episode was produced by Jim Sangster and yours truly. The episode was also written and edited by me, and our logo was designed by Jim Sangster. Special thanks to my special guest, Tony from the Doctor Who Target Book Club podcast. This podcast can be found on most of your podcast apps of choice. You can find all past episodes at podcasters.spotify.com slash pod slash show slash Doctor Who Lit. It really helps if you rate five stars and subscribe. You can find me on Blue Sky and YouTube at Doctor Who Novels, that's DR Who Novels, and on email at Doctor Who Literature, that's DR Who Literature, at gmail.com. Please drop me a line with your comments, questions, and suggestions. Thank you for listening, and whatever you do, keep turning the pages.
Doctor Who Podcast Network.